When you get in the trenches and you spar with guys at the level we sparred at, I mean, we talking about banging. You know, sometimes people got hurt a little bit, but hey, we were brothers and we still are to this day. And because of that kind of bond, you know, you stick together. Hello, everyone. It's episode 112 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Kyoshi Kevin Hudson. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best martial arts podcast. I'd like to welcome you. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, but I'm also lucky enough to be your host for Martial Arts Radio. Thank you to the returning listeners, and hello and welcome to those of you listening for the first time. If you're new to the show, or you're just not familiar with what we make, please check out our sweatshirts. Different colors and styles to choose from, but always top quality. Available at whistlekick.com, and you can find all of our sparring gear, which is the heart of what we offer, at whistlekick.com or at Amazon. If you want the show notes, including photos and links to everything we talk about today, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, sign up now. We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining our list, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. It's full of fresh content you've never heard before. So sign up for the newsletter at any of our websites. It was during the Superfoot Camp in Florida in March of 2016 that I first met Kyoshi Kevin Hudson. A tall man with a southern accent and a constant smile, he quickly became one of my favorite people from the weekend. He showed himself to be a skilled and passionate martial artist, which are the two primary criteria for being invited on the show. It took a little bit of time to make the scheduling work, but it was well worth the wait. This episode is one where we hear a lot about Kyoshi Hudson's love, not just for martial arts, but for people and for life in general. It's hard not to feel good after speaking with him or listening to him, and that certainly comes through in this episode. Enjoy. Kyoshi Hudson, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Uh, I'm glad to have you here, you know. Uh, it's going to be fun. You know, you and I haven't had a lot of time to talk. You know, we've worked out together a couple times, but uh, you know, I'm looking forward to getting to know you, and I'm sure all of the listeners will enjoy getting to know you. Absolutely. So, let's get started. Same way we always start. How'd you get started in the martial arts? Well, Jeremy, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, as far as me starting in the martial arts, uh, it goes back to 1979. Um, believe it or not, I was a little boy, uh, eight-year-old kid, just turned eight. The year end of the school, there was a kid that did a kata in a talent show in my elementary school. And uh, and also, I saw that, and it, it infatuated me. I was like, wow, this guy's doing something pretty cool. I was finishing up the second grade, right? And so I saw this, and it kind of inspired me. And then along with that, I said, you know, that might be a way to keep people from picking on me if I learn karate. So I went home. I told my dad, hey, I want to start karate. Um, There was a school in my little hometown that was in a metal building with no carpet on the floor, uh, no heat, no air, old military-type teacher that hated everybody, I thought. And uh, my dad went in there and said, can you take a kid they initially said no, but then the instructor's wife intervened and said, hey, let's let this kid try to train. And so uh, I started training, 25 bucks a month. Dad said it will blow over in three months, and that was uh, several years, what, 1979 to the day. So here I am. <laughs> so you were the first child at this school? Right. At this school, there was about 10 students. Um I was the first kid that jumped in there that they allowed to train. And like I said, I think because the, the the lady, the wife of the instructor, actually, I don't know if she saw sense empathy or, or cared or said, hey, we, we need to take kids. But I was the first kid. And then about three to four months later, a girl about three years older than me started. And then she and I were the only kids from then on that I can remember. <laughs> So, yeah, I was the first kid. She was the second. And actually, she was a girl. She was three years older than me. She used to beat me up every day until I was about 16. And uh, (laughs) then I guess when I was 16, I started getting a little stronger and could actually do something that could stop her from coming in and wailing on me. (laughs) What What was that like being a kid in an adult class, 
you know, as much as you remember back in that era, because, you know, that's kind of the tail end of, of what a lot of us would call the blood and guts era, you know, and it sounds like it was that kind of a school, no carpet, right? right. no heat, no air, I'm guessing no gear, <laughs> right, right. probably pretty rugged classes, right? It was really rugged. Um, we actually brought carpet from home in pieces and we duct taped it on the floor. So we had concrete and then tape, tape down carpet. So that was the next step. So uh, you got used to a little car, uh, concrete, but then you got used to the tape down carpet. Um, so that worked out well. I, I, I was a kid, you know, I had that other lady, this little girl that started with me later. Luckily, fortunately for me, there were about, there was two 20 something year old guys that kind of took me under their wing. And the main instructor didn't really speak to me. Uh, in fact, five years after I started it was the first time he actually looked at me and spoke to me as a human. And his first sentence was, I didn't think you'd still be here. So that, uh, that kind of set the tone for our relationship. But, uh, there was two guys in there that kind of took me under their wing and daily they would, they would bring me in and say, Hey, I saw you had trouble with this. Let me help you out. Uh, let's go over this cotta with you. You know, let's go over this. So there was, there was a couple of guys in there that, that really kind of, took me on her wing, helped me out. Uh, the main instructor did, did help too, but he, he wasn't really interactive with me. I was just in the class, you know, I was just part of the group. And, uh, we went to class four days a week from six to eight was class. And I usually got there at five, five fifteen, and left as late as I could when mama would come pick me up. So I guess she enjoyed having me out of the, out of the house, you know? <laughs> so, Normally we don't hone in on, on this kind of stuff this early, but I, I'm guessing this is going to give us a lot of context for you as we move forward in our conversation. Here we have a, a class that was certainly not catered to children. You've got an instructor who I almost want to say didn't want you there. <laughs> right. In difficult training conditions. And despite all of that, you fully embraced it. Yes. Um, How? Why? <laughs> what What is it about you that this clicked so well so quickly? Well, I, I tell you, Jeremy, I um, you know I, I'm very fortunate. I grew up in a household with two loving parents. Um, I had mom and dad. They're still married. Been married almost 50 years. Um, but you know, for some reason, dad said, "Hey, you can go try this." When I got into that environment, I fell in love with the structure. And the two guys I told you about, they kind of took me under their wing. And for some reason, that structure really was an environment that I thrived in. Um, and, and looking at looking back now, I think a lot of it was the big guy, the main instructor. For some reason, I was geared to try to please him. I wanted him to say, hey, good job. Uh, but and, and I just tried and tried and tried. I never gave up. You know, when you line up in class, you line up by rank. Uh, the lowest rank is always to the right instructor, and your goal is to move to the left to your little, you know, until you get your black belt and get down there on that end. And for some reason, I thrived on that goal structure and trying to move down to that end. And and I don't know, I was a pleaser, I guess. And the hard work and the heat and the, you know, the strictness of that kind of era, um, it didn't faze me that much. For some reason, I was just geared that way. You know, I, I, one of my theories is you, everyone needs to find their passion, and the earlier you can find that passion. Uh, the more likely you are to, to be a successful success in life. And if you can get good at that passion, getting really good at one thing helps your confidence, helps your self-esteem, just like, you know, as a martial arts instructor, which I do today, you know, if you can get kids to get good at one thing and feel like they're really e excelling at something, then their confidence is better and they're less likely to get into trouble. Um, and just for some reason, I fell in love with that structure. And, uh, you know, it's funny, the first time I ever sparred, I was an orange belt, and uh, they had just started using the Junri equipment, the old big puffy gloves, you know, the Junri ones. Yeah, and, the yellow ones? Yeah, the yellow ones. Uh, in yeah. fact, about everybody in the class, like in one month, bought a set of those yellow pads. And so I had a set of those. I put them on, and uh, the lady, the instructor's wife, said, I'm going to teach you to spar today. I didn't know that that pretty much was a session of her hook kicking me and round kicking me in the head. That was pretty much it. <laughs> you know, she taught me how to block a hook kick and a round kick uh, with my face for about um, two or three rounds. You know, I said, here's what you do. Hold your hands up. And uh, But I just fell in love with it. And, uh, in fact, you know, I, I, you, you may know I'm, I'm relatively flexible and I, I love to kick. And kicking people in the head gives me great pleasure, kind of like Mr. Wallace. But, 
she was the one that inspired me to be flexible and be able to do the split and all that. She, uh, she, she could do the split. She was the first one in class I ever saw do that. And I remember going to her one day and saying, Hey, how, how did you get where you could do that? And she said, stretch. And I said, really? She said, yeah, stretch. I would do before class. And I said, well, how much? She said all the time. So I literally took that to heart. And all the time I stretched. Uh, when I was at school, I would ask the teacher to go to the bathroom so I could stretch. I mean, I was a weird kid, man. <laughs> but <laughs> within three months, I got where I could do the split, you know, all three ways. And uh, to this day, I can still do the split all three ways. And you know, I told my wife, when I do croak, you can put me in a casket in the split. <laughs> <laughs> so so anyway, I thrived on that, that environment. I just fell in love with it. And um, I love the idea of being able to, you know, just punch and kick hard and be good at it, you know. Yeah. Well, clearly, as you said, you found your passion and you found it pretty darn early in life. And that's fantastic. I think a lot of people at that age may find martial arts and find that they love martial arts. But I don't think I've talked to too many people that embraced it, you know, as their lifestyle that early. Right. Yeah. For some reason, you know, God gives everybody a talent, you know, and luckily that was mine. Um, and, and I've been fortunate to, to make it something I do for a living. Uh, in January will be 25 years that I've owned a karate school. Uh, I actually own two. We started three, and one of my students owns the other one, but I have two. And, uh, you know, still kicking and punching about every day, uh, teaching people karate and trying to, trying to find, you know, find ways to improve people's life through martial arts training. That's what we do. Yeah. I had this vision of you you know, as a, a young kid getting kicked in the face, you know, all over, you know, roundhouse kicked and hook kicked in the face. And, you know, I, I got to admit, there's a, I, I think there's a pattern there for you, right? You know, <laughs> well, finding Bill Wallace, because anybody that, that's worked with him knows that's exactly what he likes to do to people. Oh, too, uh, right? absolutely. You know, you know, I, I never got, have gotten too far with Mr. Wallace. Um, now, in 1997, I fought for my second world kickboxing championship in New Haven, Connecticut, actually, um, in the New Haven Coliseum, which you've probably been there. Um, and I fought there, and Mr. Joe Lewis was a special guest. And, and that week, I got to spend a whole week with Mr. Joe Lewis. And uh, that guy, you know, I'd read about him. I'd read magazines about him. I had black belt magazines with him all over it. And, you know, he was one of my heroes. Oh, man, this is Joe Lewis. And I'll never forget being in Charlotte Douglas Airport, meeting the, the group of people going to Connecticut. Here comes walking Joe Lewis. I'm like, wow, there's Joe Lewis. And I didn't know he was coming over to where I was. <laughs> but, but he came over, and him and John Maynard and, and Randy Ballard and all these guys got together, and you know, Joe introduced himself. And I tell you, uh, he didn't say a lot of nice things in the beginning to me because you know, Mr. Lewis is pretty critical of people right out of the gate. <laughs> Uh, if you've ever met him, you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, it's sad we've lost that gentleman, but I tell you, he was the most knowledgeable martial artist I had ever met in history. Amazing, amazing. And I was very fortunate to actually spar many, many, many rounds with Mr. Lewis and work with him. Uh, Mr. Lewis quit sparring at 62, and uh, it was funny. I'll never forget. He looked at me and said, I sparred enough. 62, I'm done. I said, I hear you, man. <laughs> You know, he said, I'm going to quit eating good, too. I'm going to start eating some junk. I said, well, that's cool, man. He's been eating good for 62 years. <laughs> and uh, But I worked with him for years and years. And, and I tell you, Mr. Wallace, meeting him later on, and as Mr. Wallace was coming around the Joe Lewis Convention every year, I trained with him quite a bit, you know, through the years. And after Mr. Lewis passed, the next year I said, man, I got to test with, with Superfoot. I got to go do that uh, because, you know, we're all – not promised tomorrow, so I got to get out there and test with Mr. Wallace. And uh, I flew down to Tampa, Florida, and tested and started training with him quite a bit. Met Terry Dow uh, multiple times through the years and Grant and all them guys. And I tell you, uh, Wallace's theory and his strategy is, is amazing. It's amazing. You know, it's one of those guys when you see him and you work with him, you're like, why didn't I think of that? You know? <laughs> So, uh, so, uh, and you know, if I'd have met him earlier, it might have saved me a few brain cells, you know, because he was <laughs> he was really good. He's really good at manipulating distance and staying away from not being in that pocket. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, right. so it's uh, it, it, it's neat to be able to work with him. And uh, I love to kick people in the head. And if you watch any of my fights, uh, 
I kicked a lot of people in the head, but I side kicked people in the belly probably more than I side kicked them in the head. And Mr. Wallace did the same thing. You know, he had 13 knockouts from body side kicks. So That's right. you can't breathe, you can't fight, right? That's right, right. <laughs> As I've expressed to a number of people who have, you know, ended up at, at his seminars um, and felt a little frustrated at learning the material, you know, the stuff is simple, but it's not easy. No. No, no, it, it's you know, the, the beauty is in the simplicity of the strategy. And just as you said, a lot of the things that he espouses are, are you know, they're brilliant in their simplicity and so simple that most of us would miss them. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But, well, you know, he, he was fortunate to be put in a position where he had to come up with a strategy because of his injury and uh, because, you know, he was left handed and fortunately he hurt his right knee. So he was able to put his left side in front and him being able to manipulate distance and you not know that his head is coming forward and his foot hits you before anything else hits you, that that's pretty ingenious, you know? Because <laughs> yeah. with most of us, we try to move forward and advance into the pocket or within range, and it's pretty easy to detect that forward momentum. So you get a good fighter out there, he knows what you're going to do when that head starts moving forward. But with Wallace and, and that footwork that he has, it's super difficult to detect, to detect him advancing forward, and and his leg is so fast, it, even at his age still today. You know, I'd hate to have been kicked when he was thirty five in the head by him. He's probably probably pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, even even now at seventy, and we've said this on the show several times with people that have trained with him. At seventy, he can still put his foot anywhere on your body. There, I'm sure there are some people that are, you know, fast enough to block him now, but none of, there aren't a lot, right? At, at 70 years old, he's still fast enough to put his foot wherever he wants on just about anybody's body. Oh, absolutely. There is no doubt about that. Absolutely. Right. Hey, Jeremy. And just to give. Let me, let me pause one second. That's yep. right. Walk in. You got it? Hold on one second. Yep. No worries. So we'll come back and I got something to say in just a couple. So for anybody that is listening and maybe hasn't had the chance to train with Bill Wallace, um, one of the things you were talking about with the distance and just to give people something that they could do, you know, we're always talking about things kind of esoterically on the show, but here's something you could actually try. Whenever, whatever stance you're in, realize that it's your planted foot your rear leg that is always the determinant of how close you are to your target and so that's the big thing that that mr wallace works with is not so much the front leg the front leg being the one that gets people to react even though it's the back leg that determines distance so uh, a lot of the strategies are around bringing that back leg closer so oh absolutely absolutely that, that is true moving that back leg the way he manipulates it you know his uh straddle leg kind of hop kind of you know movement uh that back leg moving forward right. without detection and his head staying pretty much the same height that changes everything because you know mr lewis used to, used to say you had to control the vertical distance the horizontal distance and the lateral distance and he who controls all those distances wins the fight and uh mr wallace is a master at manipulating that distance so you know it, yeah. it is what it is you know and, and i tell you i wish i'd have worked with him sooner um however you know it worked out like it did and you know, I was gifted with a chin like a trailer hitch for a while there, so I could stay in the pocket and work when I had to. And, you know, I didn't win them all, but I, but I won a few and had a fun time with it, you know. <laughs> That's great. So we've got a pretty good idea of who you are and, and your passion for the arts at this point. And we just heard some kind of fun stories around meeting Joe Lewis and, and how you got started. But I'm sure you've got a lot more stories. If I was to say, you know, what's 
What's your best martial arts story? What would you tell us? <laughs> best martial arts story. Now you got to figure. Uh, I've been in it since 1979, pretty much almost every day of my life. Um, trained with, you know, some great teachers. Great teachers. Got to spar some great people. I used to kind of be like a Wallace. I'd travel around, and if there was a dojo, I'd stop and I'd try to spar. And uh, or if there was a boxing gym, I actually got a little better with my hands later on in my career. So. Uh, you know, that that was always fun to go to a, a good old boxing gym and, and get in there and, you know, box with some guys. And, and you know, as you and I both know, you cannot judge a book by its cover. <laughs> and er- everybody thinks they can fight until they get punched in the face. And, uh, and then that changes things quite a bit. Um, but my best martial arts story. Hmm. Wow. Jeremy, you put me on the spot here, man. My best martial arts. That's what I do. Story. That's what you do. Well, I, I'll tell you a little personal one. Okay, here's a little personal one. Um, just because it's kind of fun, and actually it's in, in my book that I, I've written that you and I discussed a little bit. Uh, when, yeah. I, when I was a young man, you know, uh, as I grew, I got to about 14, 15 years old. And as young men, you know, at 14, 15, you start filling out a little bit. You start getting a little gangly. You start getting a little taller. But if you're a martial artist, you've been training since you were seven, eight years old. You, at 15, 16 years old, you start learning how to rotate properly and to generate a little more momentum. Okay, so during this age in my life, I was sparring people in class, and I was usually hurting about everybody I sparred with just because I had zero control. And growing up in the era I, I grew up in, when I sparred, I always sparred an adult, so you could hit them as hard as you wanted to. And uh, you know, I didn't have to have control because I couldn't hurt them if I did hit them. You know. Right. But when I was about, I think I was 14, uh, back in, in years ago, people would periodically come into the dojo and want to wanna fight somebody. <laughs> and uh, we was running, you know, my little dojo was still running. It was the same one my instructor was at when I started. And, you know, it changed hands a couple of times. We had a new guy running that grew up under the, uh, or that was a student under the instructor I started with. And there was this guy came in one day that was maybe mildly inebriated, but he wanted to fight. And uh, I was a 14-year-old kid, and my instructor at the time was a pretty, uh, pretty high-strong individual. So he, I remember the guy walks in, and my instructor looks at him and says, so you want to fight? I tell you what, I'll let you fight this young kid here, and if you beat him, I'll fight you. And uh, this is, you know, 6 o'clock on a, on a Tuesday night. Some inebriated dude walks in the door. He was probably, probably 6 foot, about 180. He wasn't a big, huge guy. And I was, at the time, at 14, I was probably you know, 5'10", about 140, maybe, (laughs) you know, 120, 140, somewhere around in there. And I'll never forget my instructor looking at me, and, you know, we're from the South, you know, so it's okay to say bust him. That was what he said. He looked at me, he said, I want you to bust him. (laughs) And I was like, okay. So, you know, and this was kind of fun. This was, I was 14, and not long before that, I had seen full contact kickboxing on ESPN. You know, some of the old legends, you know, Brad Hefton, Johnny Terrio, those kind of guys. And not before, you know, during that time, I would said, well, I want to be a world champion kickboxer. And so this was time for me to get some sparring in, actually. So this, this inebriated dude, my instructor put some, uh, put some gloves on him. We got in there and, uh, about the first 30 seconds, he come in wailing and I hit him with a side kick in the body and aired him out just as good as you would anybody. I heard the old, you know, and he folded up and hit the floor and then they let him recover. He got back up and my instructor looked at me again and said, I want you to, I want you to bust him. And so the guy had his hands around his belly cause he was scared I was going to hit him in the belly. And I, I hit him with a nice lead leg round kick to the to the neck ear region, and uh, he he went stiff and fell to the to the right because I I kicked him with the right leg, so he fell to his right, and I'll never forget he thumped the floor and I just kind of stood there looking, I was like wow man I saw something like that on ESPN you know, <laughs> and uh, so so I got to be the to be the sparring partner for this crazy person that walked in the dojo wanting to fight a martial artist. And uh, my instructor at this point recovered the guy, got the guy up, and uh, told the guy, you know, he can he can leave, and he left, and we started class, and we had a good class. But that was kind of a funny story, just because as a 14 year old kid, you're not used to hitting people hard with mean intent, you know. And uh, at that point, when your instructor says hit him hard with mean intent, that's what you do. And uh, 120 to 40 pound 14 year old rolling his hip over properly. 
uh, with the proper flexibility and momentum, and there's nothing in the way between your this person's neck and you know I had my little foot pad on, but that was about it. So, so that that's kind of a funny story of of me beating up a bad guy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> And it was now, it was fun for me. It wasn't fun for the other guy, but it was fun for me. Sure. <laughs> now, hopefully, he learned his lesson. You know, I, I hope so. I don't think he wasn't wasn't sloppy drunk, but he was uh, he had been drinking. You could tell. Uh, but I think he probably remembered it when he woke up and realized that something was really sore. His whole neck and head, I'm sure, was sore. And luckily, I didn't break any of his ribs. I don't think because he was turned forward when I hit him. Uh, so it might have might have done some internal damage and. But he's probably fine. He's probably walking around a day kind of laughing about it, too, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm wondering, because you went on and you did spend so much time kickboxing. Right. Did this ha- did that experience have any influence on that? Was that really the first time you thought, oh, I really enjoy this, I want to do this? Well, you, you know, it's, it's funny. I told you I found my passion martial arts early. And like I say, around 13 years old, that was, uh, let's see, 79, I was eight, I don't know, in the mid-80s. You know, kickboxing was really flourishing. Uh, Joe Corley was putting on a PKA. You had you had guys like Rick Rufus, Terrio, Alexio, you know, Brad Heston out there, you know, doing it. Jerry Rohn, people like that, you know, out there doing it. And it was on, it was on TV a lot. It was televised. Uh, Bill Wallace was, you know, obviously there. You know, I saw him a couple times on TV. I remember seeing Joe Lewis on TV a couple of times. Um, so, you know, these guys inspired me. And at 13, I said, "Hey, I'm gonna be a world champion kickboxer," and that was my that was my mission. You know, so this guy coming into the dojo, you know, we always sparred hard because we was one of those old schools that, you know, at the time we didn't wear no headgear. We had a mouthpiece, but we just hit pretty hard. And usually every class somebody bled or got hurt. Um, but you know, uh, when I, when that guy come in, you know, it was just another day of sparring, really. <laughs> it wasn't nothing too special, but it was kind of cool to be able to hit somebody that had no idea how to defend himself. You know, that was kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people I've never had an easy kickboxing match, uh, in my entire life. Uh, the easy one I had for some reason, this guy was, they said he was like number eight in the world or something, and and he and there's no way he, I don't think he was. I think that was a farce because if he's that bad at number eight, boy, I'd hate to see number seven or six. But I ended up fighting this guy five rounder, and I hit him with everything but the ring post, and uh, and it was my easiest kickboxing ever. And uh, you know uh, the rest of them were wars and just battles. But when you come out of you know for the next six weeks, you knew you was in a fight. You know, I mean that's the way it was but uh but yeah th- i was inspired as a kid early on you know i found my passion i set my goal to be a world champion you know at 13 and you know hey god gives you a passion and a mission and that's kind of where i went yeah what do you think you'd be doing now if you'd never gotten into martial arts <laughs> wow that's a good question jeremy um you know, that's hard for me to uh, uh, get my head around because I've never done martial arts. I mean, I've never not done martial arts. You know what I mean? I mean, that's right. all I've ever done. At, at age eight, I just turned eight. Uh, I turned eight April 29th, and then when school got out in June, I was in a karate school. So from a very young age, that's all I've ever done. Um, so for me to say, hey, you know, what would I be doing if it was martial arts? I do know my life would not be at the quality it is. Um, uh, I do know I wouldn't be in as good shape, um, just because, uh, you know, martial arts is fantastic for, uh, you know, fitness and just flexibility and being able to handle pressure. And that's, that's why, you know, why we're, why it continues to be a, a popular activity, but, you know, um, people always say, you know, if you can find something you love to do and make a living doing it, you never work a day in your life. I mean, there's some truth to that. Uh, even being a karate teacher, some days are kind of tough because, not everybody takes it as serious as you do or, or as I do. So sometimes it kind of bums you out because people are out there kind of flopping around and you try trying your best to push them. And, you know, it, it, it's tough. But, you know, as a martial arts instructor, I do get to make a huge positive impact on my community. Um, you know, I try to be well looked upon by everybody in the community as, as somebody that contributes to the well-being of what we're doing in the community. You know, people improving their health, their mind, their body. They're doing martial arts. So... For me to think of not doing it, eh, that's hard to that's hard to fathom. Um, I do I do have something I really found that I love. Uh, I got my pilot's license. Um, 
I love to fly. Um, uh, me and my father actually owned an airplane for a while, and then we we sold it. And you know, who knows? Maybe one day I'll own another one. But I tell you, flying's kind of cool. It's kind of like martial arts. You can't learn all there is to learn about it, and it takes a certain technique and a certain type of person to be good at it. Um, so, uh, so you know, that's something I do love. I, I guess if I wasn't doing martial arts, I might be flying jets. Who knows? <laughs> right on. Right on. Yeah. So, of course, with so much of your life, the majority of your life being around martial arts and, and your life being in martial arts, you've taken a lot of lessons. You've learned a lot, not just punching and kicking, of course, but it's made you who you are. If we think about maybe a challenging time in your life, mm-hmm. think of one of those and how your martial arts training helped you overcome. Well, a challenging time. Well, I can tell you a challenging time. Um, I uh, had a good friend, one of the two guys I told you that helped me as a child in martial arts. He, you know, I grew up and this guy helped me pretty much from age eight on. His name was Eddie. And um, we were buddies. He actually was a corner man in a lot of my fights. Um, he would go with me, and, and he was the guy that held the ice pack on my neck, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, he, uh, you know, he was a big help. And, and one of my one of my tough times in life was, was Eddie and I, you know, we traveled all over uh, kickboxing. I'll never forget one time we tried to check into a hotel, and we went to check in, and the promoter had set us up a room, and the, the lady behind the counter said, y'all must be one of those kickbackers. And we were like, what? <laughs> and uh, it was just funny. Um, but uh, anyway, um, Eddie told me we was going to eat lunch one day. And I and I said, okay. And then the next, uh, that night, he called me. Or that night, his neighbor called me and said he had passed away uh, mm-hmm. out on a jog. He went for a jog, passed away. He's 45 years old. Um, and, you know, that was tough, okay, because Eddie used to come to the dojo every night because we trained every night at a certain time. Uh, we'd go run. We'd come back. We'd hit the bag. We'd spar. He'd hold the pads. You know, he was a big instrumental part of my life as a kid all the way up to when I was really competitive. And, you know, for him, he and I have such a close relationship. And then, you know, he said, hey, we're going to eat lunch, which we did a lot. We ate lunch a lot of times. And that day... Um, he called me and said, Hey man, I can't eat today. I got a meeting at work. I got to do, um, let me, uh, let me call, let me call you back tomorrow. Let's do it tomorrow. I said, okay. And he died that night. Um, so that was a, that was a super, super hard, hard thing to get through. But because I knew Eddie and because we both were into martial arts, we both understood that bad things happen. And we, we had been through this together. We talked about this before. Bad things happen to good people. And, and, and hey, we don't, we don't know why. We just got to continue to pursue, to push forward and, and, and push toward the mark of our high calling, not worry about what's going on around us. And, and because Eddie had passed, we knew that he, he was in a better place and his time had expired here, but he did a lot of good while it was here. And because of our martial arts training and because I could go and I could I could work out, I could hit the heavy bag, I could do my kata, I could do something to remember remember Eddie, uh, that helped me get through that grieving period. And I understand that, hey, he was my buddy, uh, and he's not here anymore, but he's not gone away. He's just gone for a little while. And uh, so, so being a martial artist helped us, helped me and the people around me that knew me uh, get through that. You know, it's okay for a martial artist to cry when they lose a friend. And, uh, you know, we lost, we lost Joe Lewis in 2012 and, uh, went to his funeral and, and, you know, I've been to several funerals of people that I've lost, but, uh, because, you know, we all, you know, we know it's going to happen, but, you know, the training and the discipline and the structure that goes along with it helps you deal with that kind of trauma and and many other types of trauma. So, uh, that's kind of how it helped. So we're still kicking, and Eddie now looks down and, and actually knows that I'm still kicking, and that's the main thing. That's right. Now, other than Eddie, and I, and I want to take out your original instructor, the one that you started with right. when you were so young, who would you say has been the most influential? Tell us about somebody that you know was really pivotal in your martial arts career, your upbringing. 
Well, there's been several, Jeremy. I mean, as a, as a young man, you know, I think through life, the pivotal person changes, you know, every, every let's say, eight to ten years. And you can probably look back at your life and instructors that you've worked with, and you're probably not working with the same instructor you did when you started uh, because either you outgrew that instructor or that instructor maybe quit teaching or something catastrophic happened. So right. would you agree that sometimes we go through different people and different mentors as we age and as we progress? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I guess during my time periods, and you can look at probably you know three and a half decades of me doing martial arts, uh, I'd say the first first decade was – you know, my first instructor um, and the gentleman named Eddie I mentioned uh, and one other gentleman um, named Ray Rice, who was one of the only kickboxers in this area um, that actually made a name for himself. He fought Johnny Superfoot Davis. He fought a lot of the tough guys back in the first beginnings of kickboxing. So I used to go train with him quite a bit and spar and work out. And he promoted probably three or four, well, maybe more than that, of my first matches. Uh, as a 15, 16, 7 year old kid when I'd go fight. Um, so I'd say, you know, Ray Rice was another guy. And then as I started training, um, pivotal people in my life, obviously Joe Lewis, Bill Wallace, you know, they're pivotal in everybody's career if they're martial artists and they're serious. Uh, and, but a couple other guys that helped me hugely, uh, Randy Ballard, uh, and Dale Sunshine Fry, uh, and Ronnie Copeland, um, Dale, Dale Fry's world lightweight champion, uh, defending his title, I think, eight times. He lost to Paul Vizio, Atlantic City. Uh, me and Dale used to spar hundreds of rounds, and, and Dale was a lightweight, and uh, I was a cruiserweight. And Dale hit hard as a truck, even at 135 pounds. But uh, his demeanor and his attitude and his his ability to, to teach the fight game and let you understand that the fight game is 90% mental, uh, was was huge in my life. Uh, Randy Ballard was our kind of our coach. We used to train out of uh, Greenville, North Carolina, up in uh, where East Carolina University is. Uh, well, there was a gym up there called the Bimjo Kickboxing Gym. John Ormsby and Bill McDonald ran it. They had four world champions, and you may not even know these guys, but they had Demetrius Oaktree Edwards. You ever heard of him? I have. Okay, Oaktree came out of that gym. Uh, Curtis Crandall came out of that gym. Dale Sunshine Fry came out of that gym. And then Kevin Hurricane Hudson, which is me, and Ronnie the Kid Copeland came out of that gym. We all went up there and started training. We used to train up there quite a bit together. And uh, it was a hardwood floor, and uh, you go in there and just spar. And uh, I got to do a lot, of, a lot of rounds with those kind of guys. And then over in Wilmington, there's a gentleman named John Maynard. Hey, do you know Maynard, Jeremy? Have you met Mr. Maynard? I have, yeah. Okay, John Maynard. Is probably the deadliest man on the planet at this point in time. <laughs> and uh, the reason I say that is because he's one of only, I think, three people to have a white belt under Joe Lewis, Bill Wallace, and Chuck Norris. Uh, I currently have rank under Joe Lewis and Bill Wallace. I'm missing Mr. Norris, but Norris is a nice guy. He's just not giving out ranks anymore. But uh, let me tell you, uh, John Maynard was, was hugely instrumental uh, as well, helping me uh, kind of grow and uh you know, I had a lot of good pedigree through the years and uh, guys that uh, just get together and, you know, spar and, and have good times and, you know, just just grow as martial artists. And when you get in the trenches and you spar with guys at the level we sparred at, I mean, we're talking about banging. And, uh, you know, sometimes people got hurt a little bit, but, hey, we were brothers and we still are to this day. And because of that kind of bond, you know, you stick together. And, uh, you know, even now, I remember when Mr. Lewis was alive, periodically he would call me and he would talk about somebody that maybe he had met. And then Mr. Lewis was always in the conversation with, hey, but Kevin, can he fight? That's what he wanted to know. Can he fight? And and I always would tell Mr. Lewis about the, the person, could he fight or not? And Mr. Lewis would say, okay, that's what I need to know. And you can equate somebody's character with the fact that if they can fight or not. Because if they're a good fighter, and they can take a punch when things are down. Their character's probably pretty solid. And uh, so that that was something unique, you know, that we did. And those guys that I trained with, the Mainers and the Dale Fries and people, if I called them up today and said, I need some help, they'd help me, I guarantee you. And I'd do the same for them. So so that's those, those are the pivotal guys in my life. And I'm sure there'll be more as I live and grow. And, you know, hopefully uh, – Hopefully, I'll get to meet new people, you know, just like you, you know, and Terry Dow, Terry mm -hmm. Dow. I used to think I could kick, but when I met Terry Dow, I was like, hey, that guy can kick. 
<laughs> he, he certainly can kick. And, uh, of course, Terry Dow's been on the show, and we'll link to his episode and, and the Bill Wallace episode in the show notes. And for anyone that's new, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the website. Right. And, you know, it's only because, and, and you know, here's a little bit of a tangent. It is only because Terry Dow lives two hours south of me <laughs> that we're having this conversation right now. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I might I might have you know, gotten to you at some point, but it's because of that relationship that I got to know Mr. Wallace in the way that I did, that I I got to earn my black belt that brought me to Florida in March where we met right. and we trained. Right. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. you know, had any of, you know, without those pieces lined up in that way, this wouldn't have happened. So I always find those things kind of fun. And, and yeah, he's, he's an incredible kicker and, and certainly, someone who belongs um with Mr. Wallace. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Him him and Grant um are, are both amazing kickers. Amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, I think uh I think in in history uh, of my life, you know, uh watching people kick and their strategy as far as how they use kicks to to manipulate distance and and as fighters, um obviously Bill Super Wallace, but Terry Dow um you know is probably the next one, you know, that's a bad dude. Uh, he, he might not be able to kick. To me, he's not as hard of a kicker, but he's an accurate, fast, strategic kicker. And uh, that's pretty amazing. I've been kicked hard by kickers. Um, but the strategy and, and the just the speed uh, of kicking is, is something that Terry Dow has mastered because of Bill Wallace, obviously. Right, right. Well, you know, and if you took the power that that Miss Wallace is able to generate, and you you scaled that up to Terry's size, and coupled that with his accuracy, he'd be kicking people in half. So it's probably good for the martial arts world that he is not he is he's he's not known in that way because uh, we we might not be here right now. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and that's <laughs> that's like Grant Campbell. Uh, I'm sure you've met Grant. Um, yeah. golly, man, you, you look at this mild mannered individual and, and then they get, let him teach you something and then you're like, wow, this guy's amazing. And it's just like Terry Dow, you know, when you meet Terry, you're like, ah, it's, it's kind of a neat little, little guy, a young guy, you know, he, you know, then you, then you watch him actually do his deal and you're like, wow, this guy's amazing. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he, he's phenomenal. We've, we've tried to have him on the show and it, it, it it's fallen through, but, uh, if you're out there, um, <laughs> Grant, still want to have you on the show. Oh, I'm, I'm sure he's yeah, out yeah. there. He's probably eating a hamburger with Bill Wallace somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> probably what he's doing right now. Uh, so let's talk about competition. Obviously, we know that you've enjoyed competing. You enjoy kicking people in the head. Um, but what is it about competing that speaks to you? What is it you like about that side of the martial arts? Well, you know, as a young man, for some reason, uh, when we sparred in class, we usually called a winner, you know, and we, we, we didn't do a lot of point fighting per se. We did some, but we did more of the, uh, I guess you would say continuous contact. So similar to a kickboxer, but was not full contact, but maybe medium contact. So, you know, it was always to me to be called the winner. That made you feel good. You know, that was really cool. Um, and, and it, I was just drawn to that competition and, and that the spirit, you know, the people yelling, the crowd screaming, the, the high that you get, the adrenaline dump that you get when you're in the middle of that ring and things are going your way. Uh, it's really cool. Uh, and, and that, that really was a, was a something that I miss because I don't compete like that anymore. And, mm. uh, you know, there may be other competitions, you know, that I, that I, participate in i haven't really you know i've been doing a little jiu-jitsu lately but i haven't taken a step to go compete in jiu-jitsu and uh i get tired on the ground jeremy <laughs> i get tired <laughs> <laughs> i ain't stand up far all day long but my goal is to stay standing you know <laughs> and uh but i enjoy that i mean the competition like i say i haven't taken a step to go compete in a, in a grappling tournament yet but who knows maybe one day but i know actually when you're in a ring and you're actually doing the deal and you, 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 you feeding the boy some, some good work, um, you know, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And, and Hey, I've been in the ring when things weren't going my way and you aren't taking a knee and you sitting on a mat, 
you know, you kneel down on a mat and the ref's about number four, and you're thinking, man, I don't know if this is going too good. I need to re- regroup here. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you get up and you, you kind of regroup and start over. And, uh, you know, I, I even enjoyed that side looking back because when when I was on a knee on the mat and there was a guy in the neutral corner who had just fed me a right hand, um, you know, that taught me a lot about myself, you know, as a person. Uh, and it's just like going to battle in any kind of battle. Uh, it ain't, it's not always going to go your way. And so competition, I think helps people understand that when things don't go your way, you can't just throw the towel in because that ain't the way life works. <laughs> and, and, you know, the rest sometimes might be counting and, uh, but you got 10 seconds to get to your feet. Well, eight before he counts you out, but you got eight to get up and you got to prove that you can move forward. And, uh, you know, that's the bottom line. And, and I think competition for some reason that clicked with me that no matter how bad it got, I got to continue moving forward. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's what I did. And, you know, I want some cool stuff, met some cool people. It made me who I was and who I am today. And, you know, as a fighter, being a fighter at the level I was at there one time, being, being the best at anything at one point in your life is something that changes you forever you know uh and and that's that's pretty cool that's pretty cool and uh and you don't even have to be a a noted world champion being the best at something you can do i mean it could be basket weaving If you're the best and you know you're really good at it it changes everything you know i went and taught a seminar last weekend about four hours from here at the gentleman's school that i know and you know it, it does a lot to be able to show people fighting and it, their eyes light up and they're like wow this is awesome you know and you know i drove four hours talked had some fun uh you know but to be able to do that and now that kind of takes the place of the competition high <laughs> you know mm, so when sure. i well you know it's kind of the wizard from afar <laughs> jeremy you know if if you said hey i'm gonna pay you to come up here and teach at my karate school you know and i did that people would appreciate me greatly because I'm coming from afar. They don't know, know who I am or nothing. So it's kind of cool. But, you know, now here in my own dojo, people are like, ah, oh, here we are again, you know, <laughs> you know, but right. when I go to somebody else's school like last weekend, a gentleman named Leon Nelson, awesome martial artist. Uh, he's one of the guys he's hoping to test for his Joe Lewis fighting system black belt this year. And he invited me up and let me in his school, let me teach his students. And he had a lot of people come from outside that, that adrenaline rush was great because it kind of that way it don't make you want to get back in the ring again you know <laughs> <laughs> i actually every once in a while i'll watch uh glory or something i'll be like you know that guy i think i could whoop him <laughs> 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 but then i'm called back to reality and you know one of my old buddies says hey uh uh-uh, let's don't let's don't think about that so <laughs> <laughs> uh. oh good times so you know, you you've dropped some some big names. I mean, you know, with the exception of of Chuck Norris, I mean, you've you've trained with two of of not just the greatest martial artists of recent time, but I, I would venture of all time. You know, and to befriend them and earn rank under them is no small accomplishment. But if you could train with someone that you haven't, and be they alive or dead, <laughs> right? Who would who would you want to train with? Alive or dead. Well, you know, uh, it was funny. I didn't train with, with Mr. Norris, but I got to eat dinner with him. Me and my brother fought in the World Combat League, you know, a time or two. So, uh, super guy. Uh, I, you know, being around him some and seeing his demeanor, uh, he is Walker, Texas Ranger. You know, that's who he is. Really? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's his demeanor. Super nice guy. I'll never forget, I walked in one of his buildings in downtown Dallas. I walked by, and he grabbed me by the arm. He said, hey, I'm Chuck. How you doing? You know, <laughs> like, like I didn't know who he was, you know, and uh <laughs> Super guy, but I mean, uh, as far that that's my little Chuck Norris story, so that's pretty cool. But uh, as far as training with someone, you know, I trained with Mr. Joe Lewis quite a bit, and he trained with Bruce Lee quite a bit. Okay, um, in fact, he trained Bruce Lee a lot. Uh, in the beginning, he did not want to learn from Bruce Lee. In his mind, he was thinking, "What could a 135 pound Chinese guy teach me?" You know, because. Lewis was a, a strapping buck, you know, 190 pound rock that that was a phenom that could kick you through a wall with, his, you know, break you in half with a sidekick, you know. Um, so in the beginning, he didn't want Bruce to teach him, but later on, they became buddies. And they started working together. 
so training with Joe Lewis was almost like training Bruce Lee. Because if you've read any of Bruce's stuff, any of the dialogue you can do or any of the books that Bruce wrote, a lot of the concepts Lewis used in his in his fighting strategies. So it's it's really neat. So I don't think Bruce Lee would be my guy. Um you know, I, I would I would like him to go back to the to the old old school back when Gitchin Funakoshi was doing martial arts and some of those guys in Okinawa. You know, I, that that might be fun to do just because yeah. of the tradition and how I I was, you know, I was just uh, stricken with the the love for that tradition and that structure and and kneeling and bowing every class and not speaking and just being really disciplined in your class. So. I would probably say go back to the Funakoshi days, back in back in Okinawa, old school, real old school. We're talking twenties and thirties, you know, and train with Funakoshi and some of his early students. I did get to train with Nishiyama one time um, at a seminar, and uh, I don't know how old Nishiyama was at the time. He was probably in his seventies, but I tell you, um, that was pretty amazing. That was pretty amazing uh, to watch a guy do a kata, Hayan Shodan. That's what he did, and uh, this is. I know he's in his seventies at the time, but for him to do that kata and just be totally amazing blowed my mind. I was like, wow. Yeah. So, so I guess Funakoshi would be one. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I was actually in Cincinnati, Ohio a couple of weeks ago, uh, at a retail show kind of promoting my book. And, uh, a guy came up to me and he saw my Shotokan patch on my gi. I had my gi on cause Hey, I'm a karate guy, you know, um, I promote my book. So I have my gi on. And uh, this older fella came up to me. He said, hey, um, I know Shotokan Karate. I trained from uh, 71 to 2000 with uh, – or 71 to 94. He gave me some years. He said, about 20 years with uh, Hidetaka Nishiyama. Do you know him? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, <laughs> you know. And so that kind of camaraderie, when you meet guys that train with the real, real deal – you know, yeah. it's kind of cool. You know, we had a conversation. My wife finds like, y'all got to stop. We got to go, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it was really neat to have that kind of bond with people. And, uh, so yeah, I would say back, I'd like to go back in the old days, some of the old, old school guys, you know, in the, maybe in the twenties and thirties in Okinawa. I know Lewis and Wallace both trained in Okinawa in, uh, the early sixties, you know? So I would like to go even pre- Pre Lewis Wallace days in Okinawa and see what it was like, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, a lot of amazing people coming out of that era and out of that location, and I think a lot of it goes back to the attitude and the structure mm-hmm. that you brought up at the beginning. Oh yeah, for sure, absolutely. Well, you know, Lewis told me years ago, you know, he was a, a GI, you know, and they didn't like GIs. Uh, the the normal local students in Okinawa didn't like GIs because they took the attention from the teacher. And uh, Lewis said, but when I started breaking people in half, my sidekick, they started watching me. <laughs> and, you know, so so he finally ended up getting his black belt. I think in eight months, he got his black belt in Okinawa. And that's because he was, he was able to, to hone one technique to the point to where he could whoop anybody with it. He could hurt any student that was there with that sidekick. And uh, that, was, that was an amazing thing. That's how he got his black belt. So. We've had a couple people on the show who have talked about being folded in half by Joe Lewis's sidekick. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm telling you, man. He, you know, it's funny. The first time I sparred Lewis, I, I remember asking uh, Randy Ballard one time. I said, hey, how do you think I'll do with him? He said, well, you do okay. He said, uh, just don't let him get you on the ground. He's actually a, a better grappler than he is a stand-up guy. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, but watch out. He's going to try to kick you, kick you with that Bruce Lee sidekick. I said, ah, oh, he ain't going to try that. And dang, we got in the ring, and he tried that. <laughs> and, uh, and luckily I blocked that one and then the next thing I knew he hit me with a jab that felt like a telephone pole being shot out of a cannon I mean it was the darnest thing I ever seen so so yeah he had a sidekick that would cut you in half and he did hit him with a sidekick later but not that first one so <laughs> <laughs> not that first one so let's talk about movies are you at all a movie guy <laughs> like martial arts movies yeah, yeah, you know it's funny. Uh, the first martial arts movie I ever watched was Game of Death, and I went I went to an indoor theater back. Uh, it was probably nineteen seventy nine or eighty, whenever it came out. 
you know, when Bruce Bruce was gone, and and uh, yeah. you know, I, that was the first martial arts movie I ever saw. So, so yeah, I, I watched a lot of martial arts movies. You know, as I grew up, I mean, here lately in the last you know five years or so, I'm being a parent, dad, three kids, business. It's hard to find time to sit and watch a movie, but you know, it it it's like a, a mini vacation, so it's good to watch a movie once in a while. Game of Death certainly a classic. Do you have a favorite though? <laughs> Uh, favorite martial arts movie, man, I'm going to have to go with Bloodsport. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> hard to, oh, uh, oh, big Bolo, uh, Enter the Dragon and Bloodsport, uh, because of Bolo. <laughs> that's, that's, that's probably my two favorites. Talk about being typecast, right? <laughs> yeah, boy, he couldn't get away from it, could he? <laughs> no. Well, when, you, no. when you're when you 250 pound Korean fella, it's hard to get away from being typecast, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> he played that role well, regardless of the movie he was in. Oh, he did good. Uh, he did good. I actually saw a picture of him and Van Damme not long ago, and, you know, he's 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 aged, but he's, he's still out there. So, uh, Do you have a favorite actor? Favorite actor? Hmm. Hmm. I, I, I tell you, um, probably my favorite actor back in the day would be Kevin Costner. <laughs> uh, just because that guy, that guy could, could do it. You know, he, he could do the deal. And, uh, um, how, how about a favorite martial arts actor? Sorry. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hone you yeah, in on You didn't that. hone me in. Uh, martial arts actor. Hmm. Uh, That's a tough one, Jeremy. Martial arts actor. I mean, Is it? there's, uh, and, and that's why, and that's why I pin people down. Yeah, you know, um, if you're going back to the B-rated kind of karate movies, um, yeah, you could pick a few. I mean, I tell you, probably the the greatest martial arts role, uh, I think, as far in the in in the last, you know, in this last what three decades, I don't know, would probably be Pat Morita in, in the in the Karate Kids trilogy. You know. Um, Pat Morita, he was he was kind of a martial artist, but he played a great role, you know. I mean, yeah. just being the teacher, man, that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. As far as actually fighting and being a good martial artist on screen, um, phew, that's a tough one, man. I, I guess maybe I, maybe I hadn't kept up. I mean, I watched every Bruce Lee movie he ever made, so I, I would have to say Bruce Lee was the best best fighter on screen, period. Um, and obviously, Miss Lewis said. You know, he could actually hold hold his weight. You know, he wasn't he wasn't just a movie guy. He could get it done if you had to. So, it's really neat to be able to to talk with a guy that trained with Bruce Lee and said, "Hey, he wasn't all fluff. He he could really fight if he had to. I mean, he knew the stuff. So, you know, being able to know that Bruce Lee would actually get down to scrimmage if he had to, that's pretty cool to know. You know, absolutely. Not a doubt. How about books? Now, you've certainly written a book, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But if you've written a book, I'm guessing you're a reader. Absolutely, absolutely. So are there any martial arts books that speak to you? Uh, you know, probably Joe Heim, Zen and the Martial Arts. Uh, that was that was kind of a, a revolutionizing book for me back in the day. I mean, it's it's a whole, yeah. whole book. I mean, you probably read it. I mean, it was a good one. Um, Joe Lewis had written numerous fighting books. Obviously, his manual, Joe Lewis's manual, is ingenious. Uh, if you don't have his manual, I think they charge about a hundred bucks for it now, but it is ingenious. I mean, there's more knowledge there about fighting than, than could ever be placed on written paper. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's amazing. Um, as far as, uh, Karate Do My Way of Life, uh, the biography of Funakoshi is, is really good. Uh, if you into the structure and the, the tradition, um, you know, I am a voracious reader, um, just because readers are leaders. You know, you got to be able to read, man. I mean, that's the bottom line. Uh, what is it they say? The only difference between you now and you five years from now are the people you hang out with and the books you read. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so you got to read. I'm reading uh, Liberator right now about uh, World War II um, and just the atrocities that those guys had to go through to, to liberate Europe. Uh, that's really interesting to me right now. Um, but, but yeah, I read all the time. Uh, for the martial arts books, I would say the biography about Funakoshi is fantastic. Uh, the Joe Hein book is really good. Um, in fact, in the back of Karate Do Kyohan, the master text, there's a maxims for the trainee section, uh, which Funakoshi wrote, which is really, really good for the martial artist. Um, so, you know, that's kind of, I mean, there's millions of other books. I got a, I got a big library and, uh, 
you know, even if I hadn't read them all, it makes me feel smarter to walk in and look at it, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So as we start to wind down here, let's let's talk about your goals. I mean, you're you're, you're still doing it, right? I mean, you're still training, you're still teaching. <laughs> now you're writing books. What's keeping you going? What's motivating you for all this? Well, I tell you, uh, we, number one, um, the longevity of people like Bill Super Wallace. Uh, watching watching him and uh, seeing his genuine care for people and the care for people learning and being good at martial arts. Um, that inspires me because, you know, he's 71 now and, and kicking as good as 99.9% of the people out there are better. <laughs> um, there's only two people that can kick as good as him, uh, Grant and Terry, and, and, and I might be close, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, that inspires me. Um, the book thing is kind of, um, I think, you know, kickboxing was a sport that, that started really doing well and flourishing, and then some bad things happened to it, maybe some bad promoters, some bad things went business-wise. So it kind of hurt the sport. So when I won my first world championship, it was a Karate International Council of Kickboxing. It was a kick world title in 1994, a 12-round decision against Neil Singleton. Uh, Singleton was an awesome little fighter. He had a record like 37-18. Uh, but when when I accomplished that feat... And then I then I did it again under another little smaller organization. Kickboxing didn't have the notoriety or the fame in the ninety four, ninety five time because MMA NHB and all was starting to hit, you know? So I didn't fulfill the dream as I thought it was gonna happen. So hence came the book in my head, you know, I I missed the mark on being a world champion. It didn't bring all the fame, the notoriety or whatever I thought it was gonna bring at the time. So, you know, now what motivates me is number one, you know, teaching these people, still teaching. Uh, I'm I really, I'm doing more seminars now, which is really cool because I get paid probably more than I did when I, when I fought and I don't get anybody <laughs> punching in the face. <laughs> so, so that's pretty cool. Um, I'm doing that. I'm actually doing some speaking gigs now with the, with the book. Um, so that's kind of fun. I've actually joined the Toastmaster organization and, uh, it's kind of cool to get speaking training, um, without having to pay a fortune for it. So that's kind of cool. Uh, wh- what motivates me now is, is number one, uh, making a positive difference in people's lives, uh, through martial arts. And my book is an extension of that because it is based about my life, you know, based around my life. So that's what motivates me. Uh, obviously, Hey, I got three kids. I got to feed those guys. So that motivates me too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, teaching and even even still sparring a little bit. I still I get a I get a kick out of being able to get in there and spar and actually be able to kick pretty much everybody I spar in the head at least once. So uh, that gives me a kick um, and I enjoy it. Um, but hey, you know, we, we, you and I and people like us have been given a gift that very few people enjoy, and it is martial arts and martial arts training. And uh, we can use it to improve people li- improve people's lives, and, and that's what you're doing with, with Whistle Kick and with your podcast, and that's what I'm doing, my teaching, my seminar, my speaking. Um, so yeah, we we got to make a difference. It might not be universe denting material, but it does make a difference in a few people. <laughs> wow, absolutely, I couldn't I could not agree more. So now, kind of your time. Tell us about this book. Tell us about. <laughs> These seminars, if somebody wants to book you, they want to get a hold of you. Tell us all that. Oh, well, hey, commercial time. All right. Uh, well, you know what they say. Steve LaValle used to say, ABP, always be promoting. Right, Jeremy? That's right. <laughs> well, believe it or not, I've written a book. I've been hitting the head numerous times, but I've still got enough brain cells <laughs> to string a few sentences together. Uh, it's a 176-page book based on my life and my journey as a martial artist, fighter, competitor, champion, dad, dad, husband, whatever, and, and some takeaways that I've learned through my life. I have in, intermittently throughout the book, I have what I call surefire strategies. And Jeremy, I have 47 surefire strategies in the back of the book that if anyone will, will implement one, all, or some of these strategies, it'll improve their life. So my book is kind of a self-help um, Christian-based book on personal growth and personal development. Um, surefire strategy number one is find your passion, and you could have guessed that one probably. Uh, but number 47 is watch the Andy Griffith show. 
So, uh, so and, and a little story about the book. It took me eight months to write it. I dedicated 10 p.m. to 12 midnight, four nights a week to writing the book. And I did that for eight months, and it just spilled out. And uh, it turned out to be about 47,000 words. Um, no outline, just spilling it out. And um, I got it done eight months. And then I, I didn't want to go the self-pub route I want because there's still a little stigma with self-publishing, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with self-publishing. I know, uh, you know, a lot of people, a uh, guy killer, um, what was it, Cal- uh, what's the guy's name? Guy Kawasaki. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he makes millions self-publishing his books, obviously. Um, there's a lot of other people that do self pub, but I wanted more of a traditional deal. But in today's world, Jeremy, you have to be Ben Carson to get a traditional deal. And, um, but I pitched mine to 44 publishers, got turned down 31 times. Uh, the rest of them I didn't hear from. I did find a literary agent in Pennsylvania who loved it and said, man, I want to get you a deal. And I got a deal with a smaller publisher in Mobile, Alabama named Evergreen Press. And, uh, they put it together, and I tell you, I'm really proud of it. It turned out nice. It turned out to be a good piece. Uh, you can get it at any bookstore because it is on the big distributor list, you know, Ingram, which is wherever mm-hmm. big stores buy their books. And um, it's called You Can Hit the Mark, Discover How Persistence Overcomes Natural Talent. And uh, I tell you, Jim, what I found in, in life and in martial arts is a lot of times the naturally gifted guys – Sometimes they don't have the heart to push through, and uh, you got to make sure that you know. Even if you you got all these gifts, you got to have the will and you got to have the perseverance to stick it out because it's not always going to be easy. And uh, just like with my life, like I said, I had a chin like a trailer hitch, and uh, I didn't want to rely on that all the time. But it's good to know you got it if you need to use it, you know. <laughs> and uh, but the book is kind of an extension of my martial arts class, and uh, I've actually got some good feedback from people young and old, men and women that really enjoyed it. Um, I had a guy tell me yesterday that I should be a writer for a living instead of a karate teacher. And I told him, well, I got one book in me. I don't know if I got another one. Writing a book is pretty painful. <laughs> yeah, a lot of work. <laughs> you know how it is. But, uh, I do. But yeah, the book turned out really nice. Uh, I was in Cincinnati, like I said earlier, promoting it at an at a international Christian retailer show because it, it is a Christian-based book. And uh it was really neat. I gave away a bunch of books. I actually had a note, an email from a publisher the other day that a, a publisher in Nigeria is looking to translate it and give it, sell it in Nigeria. And I'm like, wow, I probably not. Cool. I'm not going to go to Nigeria though. I hear it's pretty dangerous there. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think that's a place you want to go. I, I don't. I don't think all those. All the dangers there happen in a ring. I don't, <laughs> no. I don't think, I don't think they're going to yeah. square off with you. Well, yeah, it's hard to block bullets, you know? It's hard to it block. Once, once they're released from the weapon, you can't do anything about it. So, But, uh, but yeah, the books, books are, was a passion of mine, and, and I'm excited, you know, to, to have it turn out so nice. And, uh, you know, hey, I'm actually going to send you one. I meant to get your address earlier, and I wanted to send you one as a gift. Uh, just oh, thank you. I appreciate you that. Could, uh, yeah, I think you might enjoy it, just because there is stories about Joe Lewis in here and there's a yeah. picture of me and Mr. Wallace and you know it, it's something especially martial artists they'll get a lot out of it um I actually written an article that was published in Black Belt Magazine uh, in July last year about uh, uh of 2015 about Mr. Lewis uh and there's an article on blackbeltmag.org right now that I've written about my takeaways from the last Bill Wallace seminar that I hosted here in my dojo um so the editor of Black Belt uh, Mr. Young he uh uh, does amazing things for the martial arts community and um it's really neat to kind of build a relationship with him and he, he'll actually look at my stuff now and read it before he says no <laughs> 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 and i know he does that because his assistant says yeah yeah he actually read it and then two weeks later i get an email ah, it's too conversational for the magazine but let's put it on the website you know so anyway but uh writing's a, kind of a fun thing for me i don't know for some reason i, I started writing and started really enjoying it um and 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 doing it is kind of a i guess therapy in a certain way (laughs) and you can probably relate i'm doing these interviews and things i'm sure it is kind of therapy for you because you get to learn and talk with good people and other than me and (laughs) you know see what is all about (laughs) oh stop (laughs) what what is better than the only the only thing better than getting to talk to you know, bunch of people like yourself, wonderful martial artists, is getting the chance to train 
yeah. with a bunch of great martial artists. Oh, and absolutely. because of this show, because I've talked to so many, I've had these phenomenal opportunities. You know, like we talked about, like like the the strange route that brought me to meeting you. Oh, absolutely. You know, and I, I've just been so fortunate to to have that and and have this company and and to do this show. And I'm just, I'm blessed. Oh, I, I truly am. Absolutely, man. Hey, every day above ground is a great day, man. And yes. uh, we are blessed and highly favored to live in the United States. And, uh, you know, the greatest country in the world, no matter what. And uh, so we got to we gotta keep pushing forward. And, and that's one reason we got to keep training so we can uh, be fit and, and ready to defend our values in case we have to. So. Right. Now, of course, all the things that you mentioned will have links to all those over on the show notes page at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Yeah. And is there anything else you want to mention before I give you the last <laughs> question? Well, uh, no, I don't guess. You gave me an okay. opportunity to talk about my book. You, you know, you can sure. get it on Amazon. You can go to a bookstore and order it, whatever. I mean, uh, fire your last question, Jeremy. It's been a blast, all right. man, and I've, I've all enjoyed right. speaking with you. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And, of course, we try to go out on the, the highest of high notes, <laughs> All right. Give give us some some parting advice for everybody listening. Parting advice. Here's my parting advice. In fact, uh, Dale Sunshine Fry actually told me this advice many a times through the years. Uh, well, here's the advice: keep your hands up, keep your chin down, and keep your body sideways, and keep moving forward. Uh, that's the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it works, man. They, they can't be no quit in your game because you are going. Your defense is not going to be 100 percent all the time. So you got to keep your hands up, body sideways, and chin down. If you do that, that alleviates a lot of the problems. Thank you for listening to episode 112 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Kyoshi Hudson. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find links to Kyoshi's book and some other websites that we talked about on today's interview. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that as well. You can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. And the username is, you guessed it, Whistlekick. If you like the show, please be sure you're subscribing or using one of the free apps. For those of you kind enough to leave us a review, remember, we randomly check out the podcast review sites iTunes is where most of you seem to be leaving those reviews, so we check there the most. And if we mention it on the air, go ahead, email us. We're going to send you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff with a t-shirt and some other great things. And remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com or on Amazon, like our sweatshirts and our sparring gear. If you're a school owner or team coach, check out wholesale.whistlekick.com, which has just been revamped for our discounted wholesale program. We'll be back soon, but until next time, Train hard, smile, and have a great day.